Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming. My name's Brian Berry. I'm the publisher of the magazine, Nashville Lifestyles, where our February cover girl, Mallory, is on. <laughs> yes, give it up for Mallory. That dream come true. Oh. It was. This is my fourth time on Nash in Nashville Lifestyles. And I told Brian, I was like, you've got to get people like me because these celebrities, they don't even care that they're on the cover. <laughs> when I found out I'm on the cover, I, I drop dead every time. Like, it is such an honor. It really is. It, it just oh, it never gets you. old. It doesn't. And it's I not the it. first time you were on the cover. And it's not the first time you were pregnant <laughs> no, on the cover. True. <laughs> Brian looked at me whenever we were getting ready to shoot this cover. And he said, well, you know, at least we get to shoot a cover not pregnant. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> At least we do. <laughs> we might be your lucky charm. I know. It was about 10 or 11 weeks there. So, yeah, it was borderline. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And everybody, this is Allison Hudak, our editor nice of the magazine. I'm my co-host. <laughs> so, we'll get started. I want to first thank the mall at Green Hills for having us, for making us, giving us this great space to let us do it. Sorry. Yes. yes. Clap Give it for up the for the mall at Green sure. Hills, everybody. And, of course, you guys have a wonderful relationship. Right? You've been we working do. with the mall for a while. Not only have I been working with the mall for a while, but I have been coming to the mall um, <laughs> for like 20 years. So um, before we had all the cool restaurants up here, like Kava and Chopped, and there was a Green Hills Grill up here, right? Oh, yeah. Long time ago. A long time ago. I've been coming here for a long time. <laughs> a long time. And I, I love the mall, and I love all the improvements that it's made, and being an ambassador for it and just being a shopper here and everything, yeah. Since we're talking about the mall, okay, we need to know, what is your favorite store? Oh, It's that's... like picking a favorite child, I know. I know, but you know, I can do that every once in a while. When one's <laughs> acting up, I can pick a favorite child every once in a while. Okay, so I, I hate to say Nordstrom because that's a pretty easy pick, but I do like that I can go to Nordstrom and I can get makeup or Spanx or a dress. <laughs> Or shoes for Kyle. Um, I go through phases, though. I, I do really love Williams Sonoma, and I love all the new stores. Zara. I, oh. I mean, I love Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Well, I it's love a good Gucci. Mix. It's a good mix. You get your Zara. You get your Gucci. Yes. You wear it together. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. When you so when you're making decisions about style. I mean, you have such great style, but are there Thank you. things that inspire you to either think outside the box or kind of like stick with the looks that you're used to? Um, well, as you can see, I love seeing everyone in the audience in their sweatshirts. I, I see like every season of the sweatshirts. So I've got the original Tiger here. I've got the Valentine's Day. I love seeing all the Valentine's Day. I love the Living Fully book merch. Y'all are special. So I, I love a casual outfit. I mean, I love Lululemon Align leggings and my sweatshirts. So I usually look like you guys. There's really no in between. I'm usually you or I'm this, where everything has been meticulously planned and put on a post-it note in my closet. I've just now gotten like barely fancy enough to do that, only for special occasions. Um, yeah, it's organized for sure. I, I have to be. But you know, I mean, I feel like I've been pregnant the last five years. So it's really just finding what works with different body types. And um, it's just like what, what I feel good in too. Um, I don't always follow trends and do the things that everybody else is doing. I like, I just like what I feel good in. And this may be my last pregnancy. I don't know. So I'm just really owning it and excited about it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Yes. Front and center. I said, I feel like I have tentacles like Ursula <laughs> sitting up here today. <gasps> Ursula yeah. wishes she looked half that good. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the book, shall we? Yes. I want to know, like, let's start at the very beginning. What was your motivation to write this book? Okay. And how did you remember everything? Well, it's burned into my memory, Brian. <laughs> um, I remember a lot of things. Ask my husband how much stuff I remember. I remember everything. Speaking of, look, he just shows up. Oh, there up. he is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe he should be on stage and not me. I didn't even get that round of applause, Kyle. Kyle, are you available for a cover later? <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Okay, well, the memory and the why I wrote the book, even though clearly nobody cares about me here. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, at, first off, can I see a show of hands who has read the book or some of the book already? Okay, so half of you. So, you know, in this book um, is a story that I had not ever told. And it took me eight years to share the side of the story that I felt really compelled to tell. You know, you guys see the other side of this amazing life that came after this thing that happened to me. And I felt like um, for the first time, I just felt like I wasn't telling the whole story. And the people that were watching me every day that I can see watching on Instagram stories and the people that are you know, coming up to me at the mall in different places, I was just like, I'm not doing them any justice and I'm not a true influence if I don't use this opportunity to tell the, the whole story. So um, I finally felt like just saying I've been through hard times was not enough. I was like, I need to show that I need to show, show them and I want to write it in this book. Um, but it was a hard decision and it is my greatest vulnerability telling a side of the story that is not as shiny as you see on the other side. Life is is great on the other side, but I did some really hard work and I arrived at this amazing place. But um, a lot of people in this space, they'll say I've been through hard times and like, but look at me now. And I just said I needed to take this opportunity to tell this side of the story. Now, the memory part. It took me three years to write this book and it was really hard writing this book. Um, Allison, I joked with you that my mom likes the magazine article better than she likes the book because she says the book's too hard for her to read. So she's asked for two cases. She's the G-rated version of the story. She asked for two more, two cases. Um, but it's funny, like, you know, over the past three years when I was trying to decide, like, what are the things that I want to include in this book? I didn't write the book for fluff. I got 900 arms in my business. I didn't need to write a book. I wrote a book simply for the for the only reason that like, I wanted it to help move the needle in people's lives. I, I wanted to take the opportunity, if people were gonna give me the time of day to read my book, I wanted to take the opportunity to really make a change. And so writing this book almost killed me because I went back and forth and back and forth and questioned what do I include and what do I leave out? Because it mattered too much. Um, a lot of people, especially people that aren't full-time authors, they hire people to write the book for them and I just, you know, I had people trying to help in the beginning and I was like, you're not doing it right. Let me do that. I'm doing it by myself. <laughs> so this was truly a labor of love. And um, it, is, it is just my, it's the greatest honor for you guys to be sitting there with this book in your hands because I truly wrote it for no other reason than for the eyes and the ears, however you consume a book. Um, and I'm just so grateful that you guys are giving it a chance, just reading it. So it was hard to remember certain things, but certain things you don't forget. Yeah. What's but when surprising? you got three years to remember, like, you can well, find it in the memory bank. What surprised you the most as you wrote this, maybe in the process? Um, what surprised me the most was how much I, um, I want to say, like, how much I cared, but that, that sounds bad. I didn't realize how obsessed with getting it right I would be. Um, there are a lot of things. You see, if you've read the book, I include so many different things uh, that help me when I'm trying to live my fullest life. Every day looks different. Sometimes I got fear like going around in my head 100 miles an hour. Sometimes I feel like I'm just on cruise control because I'm a busy mom and I'm just doing 100 million things. And I'm not thinking like, am I living the legacy that I want to live today? Am I, living, am I being the parent and the wife and the business person? Sometimes it's that, like, I'm making a decision too fast to get out of pain after, like, I'm throwing a curveball. You know, it can look so different uh, on different days. So I wrote about a lot of different things in the book. But living fully looks a lot, it looks different, you know? Yeah. It looks different to different people. It looks different to me at different times in my life. And I wanted to be able to include all the things that I feel, I feel like move the needle for me, but I... I didn't want to not include something that was important. So it surprised me just how hard it was to figure that out. But I really think at the end of it, after three years of back and forth, that I really um, settled on the right stuff to include. So, so I'm going to do my best Barbara Walters here. <laughs> okay. What was the hardest topic to write about in the book? Um, was there anything you hesitated to include? 
No, every all of my secrets are spilled in the book. Kyle's still got a closet full of skeletons, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, the hardest thing to write about for me, hands down, was my um, about my sister. That was so. I started writing the book, um, actually writing it the month that Blaze passed away, and uh, it was like two weeks. It was it was two weeks fresh, and like I wrote down all of the details of it and. Um, some people online are really good at sharing traumatic things and turning them around and talking about them. Um, I just realized it was hard for me. I didn't want it to feel performative. I didn't want it to feel like I was taking a tragic story and turning it into a lesson. I wanted it to be like really pure. I knew people in reading this story could gain a lot from it because like what we gained just my family going through it. And I also knew from what I saw with my sister that like, if you continue to be faith filled and seeking light on the other side, you can make it through any tragedy lighter and, and brighter and living more fully than you were before. But that was hard to write because um, it's a hard story. And I don't know if anybody has the audiobook. Do, does anybody have the audiobook? Okay, a few people. So in the audiobook, when I was reading it, I've never read that chapter without crying. And when I read it in the studio, I cried through the whole thing. And it was the best that I could do. And they said, you know, this is how you tell the story. Like, we'll leave it like this. So that was uh, hard. That was a hard one. Well, you're very, I think the right word here is vulnerable in the book, right? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do that. You also talked a lot about recovery, but it's not a book about recovery. No. Can you share that with us, what right. that means? You know, I wrote Living Fully to a person who has a red flag in their life like I did in the beginning. If you have a flashing red flag, if you have something that you have to take care of or get past, there's no way to a fuller life if you keep brushing it under the rug. So I, I wanted to write that part of the story. I wanted people to know that I'd really been through something really hard. I almost lost my life to it. And that was important. But the whole second half of the book, like maybe you're like, this book isn't for me. Like I've never had issues with recovery or things like that. Well, I didn't either for the first 24 years of my life, you know, I, and I don't now. So the second half of the book is not to a person who is in recovery, but it was a catalyst to a really full life. Just like anything really hard that happens in your life, you learn so much from it. That was such a huge turning point in my life. It's the first time I hit a low like that. It was the first time I had to crawl out of a well by myself. You know, I had a really happy childhood. I, everything is always relative, but I hadn't really hit a low like that. And I learned a lot from that. So, you know, I think that the recovery piece was certainly um, important to include if, because everybody knows someone in their life probably like who deals with issues like this. I also think it's important to see someone like me who you may not expect to end up in a place like that um, to give other people permission that may be in the same position. But it's not a recovery book. And I don't, you know, I, although I'm in recovery, I don't want to be a speaker about recovery. I want, it's about living fully. It's about living a bigger life. And that was one instance of when I, you know, chose to do that in a, in a hard way. So. And you said already that living fully kind of means a different thing to different people. Yes. But sort of the elevator pitch version or like for people who are sort of just learning about this concept, mm -hmm. can you sort of give a little, like sum it up to sort of explain what it means? Yes. So, you know, living fully, I don't want someone to look at the front of that book and say, oh, living fully, is that the Miss America days or the amazing race days? Like all of these days where your life seems very full from the outside. Not only was I not living fully then, but I was like running on empty. Um, and I think it's really important to tell that story because a lot of people think that like that is where the full life exists. It's the top of the mountain. It's when I achieve this. It's when I get the husband and the kids. It's when I, I, I meet the goal. It's when I, you know, it's really like the peak. And living fully to me is very much what happened on the other side. Living fully, it's not always a life that is full to the brim. It's a life that has a lot of empty space that leaves room for living. I remember when people used to be like, you know, you got to slow down. Just be and like, don't be a human. What is it? Don't be a human 
be, be a human being, not a human doing. And I was like, well, it must be nice for you. You can do that. I, can, I have no time to sit still. But it's no way to live. It was no way to live like in a rat race running all the time at 100 miles an hour and never like taking the time to, to live my life. So living fully is, first off, it's, and I must say, it's a life where you're not afraid to experience adversity and pain. I do not avoid hard things in my life anymore. I used to. I used to avoid pain at all costs. And on the other side of that, on the other side of not wanting to have a tough conversation or not wanting to face something that might be hard or not wanting to just take chances. It doesn't always have to be something that's bad. Like you don't love your job, but you're really afraid to leave it. Like, you know, take, take, it's taking chances in a responsible way, of course. I'm not saying like go turn in your two weeks notice with no, <laughs> with no plan. I'm saying um, a lot of times people don't want to open door number two because door number one is easy, comfortable, and familiar. Living fully is not comfortable and easy. And I think our whole culture and people my age because you see people online, you see only the, the perfect stuff on the outside. You see what you used to see of me for eight years. I'm sorry, I didn't tell this story for a long time. You see that side of it, and, and you think comfortable and easy is the way that it's always supposed to be. But living fully is not that. Like, living fully is so much more rich and deep and grounded, but it's certainly full of... Um, Facing the things that life hands us and not burying our heads in the sand, not brushing things under the rug. It's, um, it's vibrant is the only way that I can use to describe it. I love the word vibrant. Vibrant is like all the colors, you know? It is, it's the hard stuff, but it's just on the other side of what happened to me and all of the hard things that happened to me, my life was so much better than it ever was before. Um, so living fully is a lot of things. Um, but right now it's that for me. Yeah. In the book, you talk a lot about <laughs> legacy yes. and family and kind of how those two go hand in hand mm -hmm. for you. But I want to hear a little bit about how your family kind of shaped you and that yes. attitude. So I grew up on a farm with 23 first cousins all on one side. Um, my grandparents lived in the center. And... All of um, my dad's siblings lived around um, the farm. And so not only was I the, I the oldest of four siblings, but I was the oldest of like 23 first cousins. You know, I had this huge, big, amazing family. Still, I still do. The compound is still there. My grandparents still live in the center. <laughs> it's it's an, an amazing thing. But I think that that's where the seeds were planted, where I became kind of a perfectionist and a leader and I needed to achieve because I was setting an example for so many people that I cared very deeply about. And um, my family, though, and the community that I grew up in, you know, I'm from a very small town and um, it's shaped me in a lot of amazing ways. I think it's why even when you told me, like, I wasn't supposed to mix and mingle until the table, I had to go through the line <laughs> first. Because I, I think it's what makes me, I want to be, like, I know so many, uh, Vanessa and Mayo, and, like, I know, all of, I know all of your names if I've met you once. I think that that's something, growing up in a small town in a close-knit family, like, that's why my people mean so much to me. And when I see you wearing my sweatshirt, like somewhere, I'll run up behind you and be like, I like your sweatshirt. <laughs> um, but my family is a very interesting family in that they were really intentional as we were going up um, in teaching us that it's really important to think about and consider our legacy. And we were like seven. I may be like, okay, but where are the presents? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So um, we met like quarterly. We would tell our family stories over and over again. We would show the same slideshow. It was this really deep, rich family history that they were really obsessive about teaching us about. But it ingrained in me as a little child that like legacy is something a child should consider. Legacy is something that you shouldn't think about when you're 75 and laying on your deathbed. How are people gonna remember me? Oh no, it's too late. Legacy is something that I think about and I make decisions around, and I reconsider every day, every week. That's why I wrote a whole chapter about it in my book, because it's so important. I mean, we have one life, 
And if you're just living it, like to get to the end, you're just doing your job, you're just raising your kids, all the good things that we love to do, but you're not considering, like, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want people to feel about you when you walk into the room? How do you want your kids to describe you, like, when they're at college? And um, whenever I was in my 20s and I started thinking, I was like, I get it. I get what, they're, what the legacy thing is. And I think it's why I'm really attracted to people like you guys care about things like this. Look at you, this, this magazine, you know? And, and like, I know what you put into this magazine. Thanks. And I know like the blood, sweat, and tears. And I know that magazines with online everything are harder and harder. But like, it is so important to you to leave this legacy of Nashville in print. Like, legacy is so important. And it's important. It's important for every single person that's sitting here today. And y'all are all young. All of you are young, I see, or you look young, if you're not young. <laughs> um, if you can get that right at a young age, um, what, a, what a way to live fully. There's no better way to live fully than that, in my opinion. So that is something certainly that my family ingrained in me. It's something certainly that, you know, Kyle's family also, he has a, a grandpa that has an amazing story that I mentioned in my book too, came over from Italy, made shoes for Johnson and Murphy. Here we are sitting by that, ironically, for some of the presidents and like has this very rich family legacy and story. And I think that our generation is so used to filling every single second with scrolling through our phones or watching TV, that we forget about like these generations and this family story and this, this thing that is legacy. So I wanted that chapter in my book to, to remind people as they read this book, just like my family reminded me constantly as, as a child. So yeah, my family is very much everything to me. They would be here right now. My sister-in-law is in the back, Jessica. She works with me now, bless her heart. <laughs> She's married to my youngest brother. We have a very small team. All these other people that are doing what I'm doing, they're like, can I get connected to your team? And I'm like, I got two people, and one is my sister-in-law. <laughs> like, yeah, I like to keep it small. Um, but yeah, family is very, very important to me and has shaped a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I won't say anything about the fact that my parents didn't teach me about legacy at a young age, but if they were here, <laughs> I would say more. Well, uh, it seeped into you somehow, Alison. I'll put you on the phone with them. <laughs> I do want to ask, now that the book is out and everyone here has it, everyone can get it, what do you hope people who read this, obviously what you hope they take away from it, but what do you hope they say about it? If they're telling a friend about this book, what do you hope that that they're saying to their friends? I hope they say it helped them to live a bigger life. I hope, um, take my name and my picture off the cover. I don't even care. I was like, you can put, they wanted to put my picture on the cover and I was like, that's fine with me. But if you don't want to, if we just want to put living fully, it's only about the message that I wrote this book. It's not about me. I used my stories. My stories were the only ones that, you know, I had to use. All I wanted to do is to move them move the needle in people's lives that they feel like they're living a, a more full life, that you feel like you can live a bigger life, to catch, especially all of you young people, like if you can, if you can shift your life just a little bit now to where you feel like you're doing this a little bit more, that's what I want them to say. There's so many books that I've read where I was like, this book, you've got to buy this book, like it changed things for me. And that's, that's I just hope it changes something for you, something. It'll be different for every one of you. I, um, when I reread it, it's different even for me. Um, and I wrote the book, but I, I learned things from it. I'm like, oh, I need to read that chapter today because <laughs> that is life. Um, but I just hope that it moves the needle. I hope that people feel like their lives are better for something that they implemented in their own life about the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And last question, because we know people want to get books signed. You yes. want to officially say hello to everybody. Yes. Were you surprised by the crazy success, like immediate success of this book. You know why I'm gonna say no? Because I know what y'all do with sweatshirts. <laughs> and I know what y'all do with Ugg slippers. <laughs> and I know what you do with anything that I've put out there. I knew I had a guaranteed community. They didn't even know what was in this book, but I knew that they would support it. And you wanna talk about boots on the ground? 
Um, these are my boots on the ground people right here. And, you know, I'll always remember, this is only my second event for this book. And I can remember every single person's face and conversation that came through the line at Books A Million. I met three, two girls here from Muscle Shoals. I was like, oh, I met five people from Muscle Shoals in the Books A Million line. These were their names. I will remember you forever. I will remember you. If I see you out and about somewhere, I will, I will remember because it just means they, these people are the only reason that I'm sitting here and not there. And um, I'm just a normal person, just like all of you guys. Um, and so for me to get to share my story, because I'm sure every one of you guys have just as amazing of a story, um, is such a, a gift. And I was not surprised at the success, not because of the book that I wrote, but because they support everything that I've done. But it's been amazing. I want to make these lists so bad, and I wish that I didn't want to make them. <laughs> so the work is not done. <laughs> but um, We were together when you made bestseller yes. pre-order. Yes. Here at the mall. We were at Restoration Hardware. Shocking. Who knows Shocking. what we're talking about. <laughs> and my, my literary agent called and was like, you're number one. <laughs> really? Um, it's, been, it's been a really amazing journey. It's, it's more fun sometimes to put out sweatshirts. We all love sweatshirts. But because I care so much about all the people, if you want to call people that do this influencers, I hope to the Lord that they will find a way to truly influence people's lives. And I knew that this was my opportunity to do that. And um, I knew I was taking a chance and a risk in doing that, but I just appreciate it because you guys showing up here today shows me that um, what I did was worth it. So thank you for everything. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you.